Um, one thing I do want to make sure and mention, you should have a ticket that looks like this. That's us buying you a drink, so don't forget it. Um, you can uh, redeem it for a drink of your choice there. There will also be food, so we will uh, endeavor to feed you yet again. Um, and with that, I think everybody's making their way to their seats. So let me move to the other uh, joyful task that I have, which is to introduce our plenary speakers, Cezanne Charles and John Marshall. Together, they are known as Root of Two. Um, they, are, they direct the hybrid design studio by that name. And Root of Two makes social objects, experiences, and works for the public realm. Cezanne is director of the creative industries for a group called Creative Many, and that is a Michigan arts advocacy organization based in Detroit. John is an associate professor at the School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. And so the work that we'll hear them talking about together, they've worked on together. I'm really grateful that we have representations of Root of Two's work here this evening. You'll see a, a sample right over here in the, in the plinth. Um, well, we'll hear about two projects today. Uh, the first one, and these roughly go in chronological order, I've been told, um, we'll have a chance to hear about is called THR 33, Tea House for Robots. And the second project is Wither Veins, a Neurotic Early Worrying System. I think you'll find the work of these artists fascinating in the way it brings the affordances of digital spaces to bear on our visceral experiences of the flow of digital information, something that we all care about quite a lot at this conference. So please help me welcome Cezanne Charles and John Marshall. Thanks so much, and thank you guys all for staying with us, and thanks to Haystack for having us, and thank you to MSU for hosting us. It's been kind of a wonderful whirlwind day for us so far. So we're hoping to kind of close out tonight, um, as, as Bill mentioned, talking about a little bit about our practice, as well as a couple of projects that we think are kind of germane to the way that we think about kind of the humanities, art, science, technology today. So uh, I've got a wee bit of a Scottish accent, so uh, uh, just bear with me, you'll, you'll warm up to it. Uh, my vowels are all different uh, from what you're used to. My, uh, as Bill said, I'm an associate professor at the Penny W. Stamps School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. I also have an appointment in the Tubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. Um, and I'm also the uh, program director for the Master of Design and Integrative Design. And my field is really sort of uh, design research uh, tangible interfaces, uh, cross-disciplinary collab uh, cross collaboration, and uh, problem-based learning. So that's really uh, my focus as a, as a researcher. So my background is really coming from performance and moving from performance into technology and then increasingly kind of curating and working at the level of kind of art and technology and science, particularly within the built environment. And then the work that I do for Creative Mini Michigan, which is the statewide economic and community development organization for the creative sector in Michigan, really looks at the crossover of artists as social entrepreneurs and innovators and really thinking through, you know, what we mean by innovation beyond market when we're thinking about you know, how we are constructing and rehabilitating and reviving our both economies and our social constructed spaces. So our work kind of crosses that way for Root of Two as well. Okay. So Root of Two, um, we've been working together since 1998. Uh, Root of Two is the first irrational number. Um, it's also in sacred geometry, it's the division of unity. And in 1998, we decided to cease our own individual practices and only to collaborate. So that's why we formed the Studio Root of Two, uh, with the intention of working in uh, uh, the space in between our respective disciplines. And really, you know, part of that original story was this notion that he was coming from visual arts, I was coming from performance. Technology was this space where we were both a little naive in between. Um, and so we were really at that time constructing our own learning and our own languaging around what it means to be inhabiting the technological sphere. So it's having this kind of shared connective glue between our work that we were constructing together that allowed us to really um, take our projects to the next level. And I think uh, whenever we do a project, we're really looking at um, 
who the audience for that work is going to be. Uh, typically, we start with uh, something that really annoys us, like anger is a great motivation factor. And what it is is we try and find the silver lining within that thing that in the world that is really annoying us, and we try and invert it. We try to flip it. We try to find a point of uh, agency for both our audience and ourselves within that problem uh, that we have identified. And while we're really only going to talk about two projects tonight, we kind of snuck in a third one called Me Not Me, which we describe as an urban comfort object, which was specifically designed for a street corner in Detroit to help deal with kind of post-industrial anxiety. So anxiety is something that runs through a lot of our work, and sort of the ability to confront that through humor and joy and play and participation is something that we're really interested in. So that's the thing on the screen at the moment with the beach balls inside the socks that people are taking selfies on. <laughs> So the first project we're going to talk about is THR underscore 33, and that is the title. Um, so we're looking at a lot of um, uh, consumer projects in this, um, and you know a lot of um, serial numbers and things have a certain format, so it's that, but it also looks like the, the number three. And in this project, we had three distinct systems that come together in the experience. Um, should I continue? Yep. Yeah. So uh, we were invited to be part of this exhibition, which was uh, at the Museum of Modern Art in Kyoto, Japan. And what it was, was we were invited to participate in this exhibition that was going to be scientists, artists, researchers, technologists, all sort of looking at where we were at that point in 2010, uh, at that point beyond the Kyoto Protocol in terms of climate change. And I think our first response was, oh no, this is going to be a total drag. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, again, it's about how we reframe initial briefs. So we spend a lot of time in our projects and our practice really doing problem definition and a lot of kind of research at that phase. Um, it's one of the touchstones for us and one of the ways that we talk about ourselves as a research-driven creative practice. And it almost always starts with a, a kind of boundary-defining text. And in this case, the boundary-defining text was Emotionally Durable Design by Jonathan Chapman. And uh, in this book, uh, it's one of the most compelling uh, arguments for sustainability that uh, I think we've come across. I mean, I think there's a lot of greenwashing and a lot of um, rhetoric uh, around sustainability. But what this does, it really sort of points at human beings as um, uh, being, uh, being the, the core of the problem and says that, well, waste uh, is really the, um, the failure of the uh, subject-object relationship between um, the things that we make and our desires. And so that really became the, the jumping off point for the project. And in the book, he talks about we should be designing projects like blue jeans or our favorite sneakers or teddy bears so that um, our relationship and our um, uh, desire and, uh, with our products um, intensifies as they age so that we don't essentially put them in landfill. Yeah, and so that immediately calls to mind the notion of hereditary objects. Most of us are in possession of what we would think of as hereditary objects, these things that get passed down from generation to generation, whether it's a grandmother's quilt or whether it's a kind of mid-century modern when we all could claim that we made stuff and designed stuff really well in America, apparently. Um, that we would pass on, right? These occupy sacred spaces in our houses. They have pride of place in our kitchens. Um, so we really thought that if we were gonna tackle this notion of design for the dump beyond kind of generic device culture, um, the way forward was in actuality to look back. Um, and so we were looking back particularly at both vehicles from that era as well as appliances and created vehicle product hybrids, which you can see over there. And you can also see them on the screen now too. So um, uh, we chose a, a toaster, a radio, and a kitchen mixer, um, all iconic prod products. But what we wanted to do is we want to animate them. We want to give them characteristics. We wanted to make them responsive um, to human beings. And, uh, you know, obviously we were going to Japan, so um, uh, I don't know if you understand the term, but in, in the UK we have this um, uh, phrase which is like taking coals to Newcastle. You know, Newcastle being sort of a uh, centre of the coal mining industry or uh, the Industrial Revolution and the industrial heart of, uh, or one of the industrial hearts of um, the UK at the, uh, in the 1840s, beyond. Um, so going to Japan, you know, we thought, okay, right, we're going to take some cute robots and we're going to build a tea house. <laughs> um, 
And um, so part of it was really about this notion of, you know, how do we actually interrogate the formal rituals around kind of functional objects, right? So we all have a kind of codec for how we make our coffee in the morning, how we make our toast, how we take it. And it's a very ritualized practice. And so we were trying to think about how you turn a museum space into that space where rituals can happen, and then how do we begin to subvert them a little bit. So what we did was um, we uh, designed this um, parametric, parametrically generated surface to create the tea house. Um, so it takes the actual dimensions of the uh, imperial tea house in Kyoto, um, but sort of reimagines it through a sort of a design fiction, futurizing sort of the concept of what might the space and the house of the future be where your appliances would go to update their firmware, to uh, re-energize themselves with solar energy, and to uh, essentially relax, because if these are your children and your pets, then they would need time off. So un uh, being able to sort of define what that relationship is um, when, you're, when your appliances are um, on vacation uh, was uh, one of the sort of points that we started from. You know, so again, I think when we talk about how we begin to invert subject-object relationships, there is kind of this almost notion of, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that, right, in all of our projects, right? Um, and so you all of a sudden have, you know, a radio that when you come into contact with it, it says snarky things about being humans back at you because it doesn't want to actually play the channel that you're playing. So when we talk about engaging in that kind of design fiction, it really is about trying to um, give these things a, a kind of animus. And then also, you know, getting people in public spaces to, to become part of the performance. And so the other part of the system, so there's the architecture, the structure, there's the robots themselves, and kind of the third component is we worked with Omron Corporation using their smile scan technology, which means that in order for you to even get access visually to the robots, you have to be smiling. And, and you're only going to get access to the degree to which you smile. So if you smile at little, you're only going to see a little bit of your robots. If you smile a lot, they're going to open wide. Um, so again, just you know, trying to figure out how we create these playful spaces to talk about these really serious subjects, because ultimately we are concerned with how do we get beyond design for the dump, but we're not going to do it by making everybody wear a hair shirt. So, so um, uh, the, the behavior of the robots is set, I mean, when they're in there doing their own thing, um, uh, they have these uh, routines that they go through. So the, um, um, the, the um, um, kitchen mixer that you can see on the screen at the moment is, um, you know, it goes every which way it wants. It's just rolling around in and it's driving around. Um, but when the eye opens and it sees a smiling human being, uh, it starts spinning in one direction because that's what human beings expect from a kitchen mixer. We want it to mix stuff for us. Um, the radio um, scuttles backwards and forwards like a crab. Um, and when a human being is there, I actually got um, some uh, samples from old classic science fiction movies, which are kind of um, uh, critical of human beings, and it plays those when someone's there. So it's a kind of snarky personality. And the toaster trundles around on its, uh, um, on its own until the uh, eyes open when you're smiling at it, and then it extends the drawers as in like, can I, can I have some bread, you know, I'll toast some bread for you. Yes. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, I mean, this was really um, our way of flipping the, um, the, the invitation, really, to uh, really dwell on um, something which is not going so great, you know, the uh, adoption and the, um, you know, uh, constraint of the, the Kyoto Protocol, and then trying to think, okay, right, so how do we take the sustainability idea and flip it, put it back on people, have that subject-object inversion, um, and uh, at the same time provide some joy that, uh, you know, uh, make someone aware of the, uh, the, the decision-making ability within that moment. And I have to say, for people who practice museum studies or art historians, we also wanted people to spend time with artwork more than the 2.2 seconds that they do in museums, apparently. Seven. Or seven. <laughs> um, so that was kind of another motivating factor, was like, how do you actually get people to take time in museums differently and to socialize and to laugh? Um, the museum was actually going through a transition. And this is another thing that we often engage in in our projects, is really the, the organization and the organizational systems that are part of the invitation for us to be in, we really engage with that too. And so one of the things that the museum had been going through was a major shift in directorship. It had been 
under a directorship for 20 years. It had been a very uh, staid museum that didn't allow people to take photographs and didn't allow people to you know, do drawings. Um, so during the run of the exhibition, they were also hoping to sort of change the relationship that their audiences had with museums. So we really felt that our project needed to be a partner with them in that. Um, and so most of the time our works work on a number of levels where we're considering all the stakeholders that we have in our systems. Okay, so we'll move on to the next project, the Weather Vane project. Um, so this was another invitation. We were invited to be uh, part of the Folkestone Triennial, which actually took place last fall. Um, so it was uh, August through November. And uh, this was the third triennial. Um, and what it was is Folkestone is, um, uh, you know, this quaint English seaside town, which is uh, down on its luck. And the triennial was a way to sort of like um, uh, turn it around. You know, I mean, everybody's trying to regenerate their cities, reinvent themselves for the 21st century. And Folkestone, uh, they want to do it by, uh, through art, public art in particular, and engagement with the local community. So following kind of immediately along from the work that we were doing with the Tea House for Robots, we really had engaged with kind of mid-century modernism, really trying to tackle like industrialized economies. But we were also kind of in our new environment. We had just moved to Michigan in 2007 from Scotland. And some of the things that really struck us and some of the narratives that we didn't kind of realize, because you know there's this kind of uh, dominant narrative about moving to a post-industrial state and a post-industrial city within a post-industrial state. And what we found was, well, A, industry is alive and kicking in really weird and different ways. But B, it also rubs up and coincides with previous centuries of industry and industriousness. And even just the notion of how we think of what the car is and what the car has done to the modern city, and then to kind of go back through the Henry Ford Museum and hear their curators talk about the fact that actually what you know he was trying to invent with the Model T was a system to you know increase equity for farmers. Right? So there's this really deep agrarian um, legacy both in the city of Detroit and in Michigan that we found fascinating. And so as we started kind of looking coming off to House for Robot, what we started noticing in the landscape were all of the wither veins that you can kind of see in Michigan. So we were trying to reconceive the, the weather vane as an um, agricultural era uh, informatic device and saying, okay, so if that's the case, how do we, how do we update that for the 21st century? So what's the, what's the weather vane for the 21st century? And, you know, I mean, immediately, obviously, we thought of Chicken, chicken Little or Chicken Litton, if you're from the UK. And you know the, the fact that the, the contemporary media um, use anxiety and fear as a sort of motivating factor, and the fact that we're able to pay uh, attention to the uh, media of our choice, so it becomes a, a self-reflexive um, kind of cycle, and uh, you need know, to pay attention to what you want to see. Um, so I mean, it seemed like the, the headless chicken. You know, I mean, the media's got us running around like headless chickens. Um, and you know how to basically instantiate that as a physical object in a public space was really kind of our, 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 our goal here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's that kind of ability to pay attention and kind of dwell on objects for a long time until maybe some of their narratives reveal themselves. So, you know, there's that particular point of view when you look at the ordinals on a wither vane, which are N-E-W-S, that, you know, doesn't make the stretch very hard to get to a weather vane and news and really trying to figure out what kind of climate we're creating, generating, and being surrounded by as we think about our news and media environment. So um, we're invited by the curator, Lewis Biggs, uh, to be part of this. It was going to be uh, a number of commissions. Um, so we started by making some visits to Folkestone to actually understand you know, uh, where we could actually make these insertions. So we'll talk a little bit about the, the, the local context. So Folkestone is actually the closest point in the UK to France. It's the point where the, uh, the Channel Tunnel, tunnel comes, comes, out, comes out. So Dover is where the ferries go, um, and uh, uh, Folkestone is where, the, is where the trains come in. So that makes it the first point for immigration from uh, Central and Eastern Europe uh, in, in the UK. So that has really driven a sort of like fear and anxiety of um, uh, immigrants. So there's a sort of east-west split in the town. So we've got this sort of more elderly uh, retirees who are there, and then you've got the younger sort of um, incomers from the Czech Republic and Bulgaria. And I mean, it's one of the one of the first um, uh, uh, 
lo local councillors to be elected from the United Kingdom I Independence Party was actually in Folkestone. So, you know, again, you have like these, um, you know, dual competing narratives. On the one hand, you're being kind of given a tour of a British seaside town that by any other name, you can get great fish and chips and enjoy like a chalk ice by the seaside. Um, and you can kind of walk along an Edwardian promenade and look out and 22 miles, you can see France and isn't that wonderful. But on the other hand, you're getting these very deep narratives about anxiety around immigration, around thinking about the fact that the high speed train that now connects them to London um, so that they can be there in an hour is creating a certain amount of creative class displacement in the, in the region. Um, and then on top of that, this kind of notion of where do we sit in kind of both being part of Europe and also feeling that the UK itself, and as some of you probably know now, are actually planning on holding a referendum to break away from Europe. And so, you know, all of these things are kind of underlying what can easily be glossed over as a day out by the seaside. And so we wanted to figure out a way to kind of deal with these troubling currents, but also, again, find the humor, find the lightness in it, so. So the weather vane system itself has a number of inputs. Um, it, uh, primarily, it uh, runs on routers and news feeds. So um, as journalists submit stories from all around the world in real time, the chickens are actually responding to that. Um, and we wanted to give people agency, so we wanted people to actually feed back into the system, so we used Twitter for that, so we used the Twitter API so that we could um, uh, aggregate uh, t tweets from um, local people or people on the internet. Um, and really what it is is a headless chicken that spins around and changes color. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that, that's the sort of like, you know, sort of high level sort of version of what this is. Um, but we'll break it down into how, um, uh, how it actually does that and what's going on under the surface. So kind of one of the first things as we were in the research phase of the project was trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to parse these news feeds, right? How are we going to actually have some system for actually understanding what fear would be in the context of bringing in routers news feeds? And so we um, looked at the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, had made public um, a social media monitoring handbook by the Homeland Security um, that publicizes their list of keywords that essentially that, you know, the more on blogs or social media media, you have one or two or three occurrences of these terms, is essentially kind of how the robots sniff your site. Mexico. Yeah. Afghanistan. Yeah. Tornado. And erosion. And they also have misspellings, which I find interesting, like <laughs> lightning. Um, <laughs> You know, so they're, they're kind of trying to maybe take advantage of the fact that we, we don't know what makes us afraid, but we spell it wrong when we do. Um, so that, um, that forms the, the basis of the library that the chickens are actually parsing the news feeds looking for. But then we went all over again and we did um, workshops. So we did a number of workshops with um, local people. From, we worked with the high school, we worked with um, community groups. And what we did was we, rather than just going in and asking people, what are you afraid of? Um, what we did was we had some hands-on making workshops where we allowed people to build, um, to laser cut their own version of the chicken, to uh, program on Arduino to make it spin around and make an LED change color. And over the course of doing these workshops, um, we got talking to them and you know, we're asking them, you know, well, you know, what concerns you? What's going on? Uh, what are you worried about? So you can see some of the keywords that uh, local people give us there. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things uh, that we were kind of shocked by is the notion that they now have a kind of Michelin-starred restaurant being run by one of Gordon Ramsay's protégés. So gastro-tourism came up um, as a real concern and worry that, you know, all of a sudden, like, this was going to be something that, you know, was changing the character of the place that they knew. Um, but you can see that there are things like apathy amongst youth, um, you know, in general under 18s. Uh, they would call them youth, I think. Um, but, you know, we had a number of things come up, including dog poo and class prejudice. And so how you kind of, you know, uh, validate all of that and put that into a system, you know, is essentially trying to create an opportunity for sense making that goes beyond kind of just general fear. So what we wanted to do is want to re represent um, uh, the diversity of the communities in Folkestone. Uh, so we tried to engage as many different people uh, and different uh, communities as we could. But uh, part of that was we wanted this other way to localize each chicken. So uh, the previous two triennials had always had um, a sort of like east to west access along the seafront. So uh, any visitors, and you know, half a million people coming from London to see the exhibition. 
um, would sort of promenade along the seafront and it'd be glorious and wonderful, but they never actually got to see any of the neighbourhoods where, you know, teenage pregnancy, the capital, uh, the highest degree of teenage pregnancy in Europe, you know, some of the drug issues and stuff like that, you know, and they're never really going to go to those areas. So what we were doing in coordination with the curator was to try and reorientate the, the axis, the, the pathway that people would come from the railway station to actually follow this breadcrumb trail of um, artworks. As it, so that we'd actually get to experience the whole of Folkestone. So we used um, the five chickens in different um, uh, locations to, as basically the basis of that breadcrumb trail. Yeah, so again, it's this notion of both engaging on one level with, which is, you know, what is the curat you know, curator's vision and his brief and his manifesto um, for the triennial and how the triennial operates as a kind of regenerative mechanism within, you know, the city, but then also thinking about what can we talk about in terms of what are public spaces that are available to us as artists in the city. And, and it's kind of amazing when an entire city throws open its doors to like 18 commissions by artists from all over the world um, for a four month period and they kind of make their public spaces available to you. And so in our case, we had everything from the second oldest operating um, public house in, in Folkestone, which you know dates from like the 1680s um, to you know an adult education uh, and literacy center that's really looking at how do we you know retrain people and deal with digital literacy to a Napoleonic era battlement um, to again actually putting a chicken on top of said Michelin starred restaurant um, at Rock Salt. Uh, and then, you know, finally thinking about this notion of quite often the arts are this kind of public gathering space and so actually having one on a theater space um, within kind of Folkestone. And so the final way that we then added to that layer of keywords um, in our database of fear, if you like to call it that, of 711 uh, words, was that once we had those sites and had those neighborhoods, we kind of walk up to that line of creepiness which is we started doing demography work. We wanted to see how marketers think about publics, how people who are you know, actively sort of trying to sell your vision of reality back to you are engaging in that work. And so we kind of took all of the postcodes of where the chickens were and looked at the news media outlets that they say are most listened to, the kind of brands that are most bought by people in that neighborhood, and then kind of followed and tracked those news outlets and began to kind of scrub those headlines to add back into our database as well. So each chicken responds to the sort of uh, generic uh, dem de demographics of the neighborhood in which it's placed. Um, so I'll talk a bit, little bit about what's actually going on in the system. So, as I said, when journalists submit a story to routers from anywhere in the world, there's a set format that's done, and this goes out as, a, as an RSS feed, right? Really simple syndication feed. So, I mean, there's our system built for us already. All we really need to do is, um, by using, um, you know, open source uh, thing like feed parser, we can read that text because we know the order that things are going to be presented to us and that we're going to be given the location, we're going to be given the abstract of what's happened. So we can write the software to basically read that and to then uh, feed and pass that information on into the other parts of the system. So what we're doing is we're reading the text of, you know, an example that was just up there was Baghdad. Okay, so what's the latitude and longitude of Baghdad? You know, we can then calculate uh, from that uh, using a, a, another script called GeoPy. Um, this all runs on a Raspberry Pi, by the way, um, it's so, uh, which is a single board Linux computer. Um, so it's about yay size. Um, but uh, we're able to calculate uh, the, uh, where something has happened and what the distance from Folkestone is. Uh, given the keywords, all the inputs that are coming into the system, we're able to determine the level of fear and the threat level of that. And that will drive the number of revolutions of the chicken uh, using the homeland security of like, a, you know, green, blue, yellow, orange, red. You know, so um, also low, guarded, elevated. I find it odd that we start at elevated most of the time when we're yellow, and then we go to severe, and then finally high yeah. red. So we're constantly in an elevated state of fear when you're in the airport, yeah. which you know I can understand a little. So and then having the, uh, you know changing the lighting on the chicken so that it uh, responds to that, but being also being able to allow people to either add fear or subtract fear from that system. So, um, I would say putting five of these in Folkestone um, and 
you know, having them there for the three or four months of the of the of the triennial. Um, also, we needed, in some ways, to, uh, a way to elevate it off the roof. So it seemed only natural, like to use a kind of RKO radio tower kind of thing. But then, okay, uh, you've got this francophile or uh, francophobe sort of thing in town. So um, why not make it the, the proportions of the Eiffel Tower? So the towers that the chickens are on, you know, not only are we taking the um, the national symbol of France, um, it is literally the silhouette of the Le Coq Sportif brand. Um, with its head cut off, but it's also the, um, uh, the national symbol for France that's been decapitated and it's been paraded on top of the Eiffel Tower. We really like France. I have no issues with the fact that I'm called Cezanne, honest. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it became really important for us to sort of think about this as a collection and what is left behind. Because one of the things that happens as part of the Folkestone Triennial is some of the artworks are acquired as permanent parts of the Folkestone Artworks public collection. And so two of our weather vanes are actually going to remain on site in perpetuity. Um, and so they have been chosen as the cube site in the rock salt. But when we began sort of just thinking about you know, this notion of what is and isn't public. And there's obviously a physical, real notion to public space, but I think equally we were interested in what is a notion of digital publics. Um, and so who are our online tribes and how are they having access to the site as well? So, so we had a, um, a website, so weathervanes.com, where anyone can log on and uh, you can use the hashtags um, keep calm, as in keep calm, carry on, or hashtag sky falling, the sky is falling. Uh, to either add fear into the system or remove fear from the system. So when you go there and when you vote either up or down, what it does is it then gives you a, a, a live map of the five chickens um, with the real-time uh, situation of each of them. So um, you can see the overview there. If you were in Folkestone, you'd be able to walk around and see, well, the one in the, the most northerly one's blue and the one on the east is red. What's, what's going on there? Um, whereas in, uh, online you can actually see the, the overview of, uh, of the whole system. So, um, uh, you know, they've got the website, which is if you don't have your own device or you don't want to use your own account, but the, when you tweet to the chickens, uh, you'll get a tweet back like, uh, you know, uh, um, you know uh, fear has been added on your behalf or, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, rational minds will prevail. <laughs> <laughs> and so local people in that respect have the ability to, um, if, if they disagree um, with you know, what's going on in the response, they're able to madly tweet and uh, try and calm the chicken down or if, if they, wait a minute, you need to. And of course these things are spinning and changing color. So, so we'll show you them spinning and changing color a little bit. You know, so again, a lot of our work is about point of views, right? And how do you actually encompass as many um, possible points of view into a work? How do you actually sort of seed this notion of agency? How do you create kind of feedback loops? Um, you know, so for us, we really understood our position as privileged artists coming into a community, kind of landing um, for a very short time, but somehow becoming part of the ecosystem and trying to do it in a way that respected the fact that, of course, we're, we're foreigners, um, but at the same time, trying to, to, to at least create a position where people could have a say and could figure out how they feel about a system and also maybe take ownership of a public artwork in a way that's very different than if it's a static work, perhaps. Um, so we were interested in moving from the static to the dynamic very much in the work. The other thing is, um, uh, you know, the the weather vane is, is a relatively innocuous thing. I mean, it, I mean, Folkestone's full of them, right? There's everything from foxes to sailing ships to you know different types of weather vanes. I mean, vane is Anglo-Saxon for flag. So, um, uh, but the repurposing and the and the recreation of the uh, traditional object, the traditional decorative object, as an informatic device. You know, it's it's essentially just updating the lens through which we see it as an informatic device. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things we like to do is, you know, we kind of like to take away a little bit of the magic. So you can actually see what it's like to actually try and construct it. We had to hire a giant crane and put it up there. 
Um, you know, so we're always trying to kind of play with revealing that tension of yes, it's art, yes, it's design, yes, it is this fiction that we're creating, but we're always gonna give you the show. We're always gonna give you the blueprint. And for us, the reason why we titled our talk today about moving from public art to public platform is this is kind of the next stage that we're moving into for the project is actually figuring out how to do it as an open source hardware and open source software project that allows people to create their own instantiations of wither veins. Um, so, yeah. we'll so I mean, we got a lot of press on this. You know, we're on the front page of Wild, you know, which is like 20 million hits a month. Um, you know, the Guardian, Fast Company, all this stuff. So that's all great. Woohoo! Um, but it's like, you know, how do we get beyond that? How do we uh, we create this system, which is a you know a, a tangible data visualization system for public places? You know, people are going to pay attention to a, a headless chicken that's changing color and spinning around more so than they're going to, you know, the actual in information or raw raw, raw numbers. Um, so the other thing to think about is like the impact that this has. So uh, in terms of like, you know, everyone, you know, what's your metric? So, uh, you know, bottom line is usually the bottom line. So, I mean, we're looking at for the, the triennial over a, a nine week period, we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, 2.7 million pounds. So double it for dollars, let's say, um, in terms of like visits to Folkestone. And then you've got like, in terms of the PR value of all the coverage that, that received, you know, you've got, um, you know, somewhere in the region of 65 million, dollar, uh, million pounds in uh, PR value. So this is about change in perception, not only for the people of Folkestone uh, about their own place, but uh, Folkestone around the world. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of our projects deal in this kind of notion of engaging at the very least with a socio-technical imaginary and really trying to, um, understand what is the difference maker there and what is both kept and what is left out. Um, and then also really trying to embrace the idea that, you know, creative led regeneration, creative led um, rethinking of the economy and public policy and what are the interventionist practices that lead to that. You know, as artists, we are complicit in that, but we often want to turn a blind eye and we kind of ask the question, what happens if we go in eyes wide open? Um, understanding that this is part of the remit for how art and culture gets done these days. So if we are the shock troops of gentrification, okay. Uh, so let's look at what that means. Um, what that means is um, we've got some funding from the Knight Foundation to actually open the software and provide it to uh, different nonprofits and community groups or anybody who wants it really to use the software and hardware for their own purposes, regardless of what that is. Yeah. And uh, Miami wants their own set of weather vanes. So with that, um, we're going to say thank you very much um, for having and hosting us today. And we'll take any questions. Uh, we have a little bit of time left. But I just want to thank you all so much for having us. Thanks. We'll use the uh, mic again so that we can get the question on the live feed. So if anybody has questions. There's one there. I'm curious about uh, returning to the tea house for robots. Um, whether you were working with or thinking about the ways in which materials degrading and technology continually updating, especially around energy technologies, feeds into that cycle of um, discarding tools, um, especially as you were kind of looking back to past tools that are discarded, some oftentimes because people are not emotionally attached to them, but also because a, uh, a, a mixer might be much more efficient today. Yeah, I mean the the tea house skin is actually a, it's a it's a hundred percent synthetic paper. It's it's mm. typically used for book jackets, um, but it's it's completely recyclable. Um, and so, I mean, the choice of the materials that went into the um, uh, into the making of that structure uh, it was very co conscious of that. And we, we had, in, I mean, it didn't actually work as a solar um, repository, but the idea of like the, the transmission of light in there was important because you know it's one of the things. I mean, doing the um, I mean, and with my other hat on as a professor at the University of Michigan, you know, I mean, um, one of the things that we're constantly looking at is you know how do we balance the budget in terms of energy, and you know, I. I teach a course where we specifically look at that. And I mean, solar is the only way that we can really do it. So it's, um, we can get into that later. 
But um, the, the the idea of like, well, what does that actually begin to look like? You know, I mean, are we looking at black glass or are we looking at um, organic photovoltaics, which are much less um, uh, uh, efficient, but are essentially chemically uh, identical to dye, right? So I mean, uh, uh, you know, we import um, enough uh, textile currently to uh, each year in the US that would essentially allow us to cover 200 square miles of uh, land with um, organic photovoltaics, which is what it would take approximately to run the United States for a year. Other questions? We have, <laughs> sorry. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, I have a question about wither vanes. When you first installed it, there's obviously the con informational context. People understand what it's responding to. But since you've left two installations there, how would someone new to the area know what they represent and how information goes to them? So how have you ensured kind of the legacy of the project? So we're working, um, there's a separate curator for the artworks collection for the triennial, and so there will be signage on all of the projects. It joins, I think, an existing group of 10, and there's a full nine of the other projects um, from this last triennial that are gonna kind of come online. So they have education programs, they have walking tours, they really try and make sure that this, that the public art that has been commissioned for Folkston doesn't become pop art. Um, so, you know, a lot of it has been about creating both materials online, so they have an interview with us talking about the project, they have access to all the links, the links are being maintained, um, both the Twitter account as well as the website account, and then really thinking through with that curator, what are the types of educational programs that can happen around kind of the Folkestone artwork walks that they do, um, um, so sorry, that it's being included in. Can I draw your attention to, I mean, during the run of the show, they had, um, uh, as it says there, you know, uh, 203 events. I mean, it's, it's really staggering the amount of commitment to the local community that, um, that, that, that they do. I mean, it's a big part of the program. It's not just, I mean, this is not just about attracting IT businesses to relocate to from London. It's also about how do they sustain the existing community. I mean, the, the major funder behind the triennial, Roger Tahan, is from Folkestone, and he um, was one of the co-founders of the... Um, the Sage Insurance Group, uh, which he sold, and as he's actually elected to basically put, you know, the, the proceeds of that back into Folkestone, and obviously, he, you know, he's got motives or whatever. But the thing is, he um, any property that becomes abandoned or whatever, he's he's buying that property so that it doesn't become any more pro problematic. And obviously, you know, business is business, but at the same time. You know, with the curator, with Lewis Biggs there, you know, I mean, there's, I mean, he's got a track record of the Liverpool Biennial, and I mean, I think it's a unique type of, you know, we have these great festivals, and it's, uh, everyone gets to, you know, fly there and have their wonderful art experience, but the thing is, what, what Lewis really brings to this is the fact that it's not just for the internationals who are flying there, it's, and the legacy and the fact that it is a public art, it's a permanent public collection is because it uh, sustains the legacy uh, in, in the town. Yeah, and I'll add to that, um, you know, the triennial is one of a handful of strategies and projects being managed by the Creative Foundation. And so again, when I talk about this notion of, you know, we really try and engage with the stakeholders that are inviting us in, the Creative Foundation actually runs properties for, you know, young businesses that are starting up. Um, so, you know, we made sure when we were there that we went around, that we talked to them, um, that we tried to create like links between that. Um, and so a lot of our strategies about how do we engage in multiple levels in an organization so that that information actually is seeded long after we've gone. So there's, there's an intentionality about kind of recognizing that we're kind of running in and then running out. So it's about how do we create relationships and, and we've been maintaining those relationships now that we're back. Other questions over there? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to uh, ventriloquize my li my uh, wife here because uh, uh, she's organizing her own conference at the moment. But um, she's an, an artist, and, and her basic uh, project is the problem with problems. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and what she's uh, interested in, or her observation is that, this is gonna be a sort of a comment about the meta of this, right? So, um, so her observation is that, that, that people don't know who they are without problems, that problems are sort of an essential component of, of identity and that when, when people don't have a problem, they sort of panic and invent one, you know, so that, so that they can know um, who they are uh, uh, that way. And um, her work has gotten a lot of pushback on two levels. The, the, and the first level, of course, is, is people who wanna say, no, that really is a problem. And then the second level is, um, don't tell us that, we, that we're inventing our own problems, right? And it, so I'm wondering if, if, if you've gotten that kind of pushback as well. Um, I think we have managed to maybe skirt some of that because we employ tactics like humor um, and play quite honestly, in our work. It's really, really hard to be mad at a giant inflatable on a street in Detroit. Um, <laughs> you know, and so I, I feel like what we often get is the email like a couple weeks later, which is, wait a minute, <laughs> what, how did that go? Why did, what was that about? Um, and, and then that, again, shows that we're creating opportunities for dialogue. Um, but there is that kind of initial acupuncture. I mean, John is really great at kind of describing our work as, as this kind of little, you know, strategic insertion the of a... prick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, insertion of a needle that, you know, strategically placed, it, it you know, opens up a lot. Um, so to your point about, you know, this kind of diagnosing or this kind of um, using art as a kind of diagnostic for both problem definition and problem solving, um, I think it is very much there. It's, it's normally kept in the realm of the curator. And I think that that's where maybe the bad manners comes from, you know, the artist who dares to kind of step into that space perhaps. Um, and there's something definitely around that that I think um, is really different and really particular um, to, to with the context now. Others? So. Anybody else? We realize we're the only thing standing between you and beer at this point. Yeah, a free beer at that. So help me, help me <laughs> say thank you. Thank you. So I think John and Cezanne will join us over at the Broad and we can continue the conversation over there. We'll see you in the museum. Thank you all for a great day.